so we are now in resuming our Acts series. Um, I call this God is in charge. This is Acts 5, 17 to 42. This has been somewhat of a um, somewhat of a difficult um, set of passages, I would say, set of verses to to see what, what is God saying. There's so much to get out of this. There's so much to do. There's, there's, there's quite a traditional view on it. And we could probably look at the, because it's about the persecution of the apostles. And we can say, whenever you're persecuted, uh, go out and just serve God. And um, we can do all those sorts of things. But um, I think it, it must always come back to God. Uh, yes, there's application, but um, it must be always about God. God is in charge. And so it's been an interesting week just thinking around these verses, praying and, and just trying to hear God. But I know that the Holy Spirit always delivers every single time, every single time. And, and he, I hope and pray that he did uh, this week. <laughs> uh, and, and that's not on his part. It's all on me in that sense to uh, hear him and, and discern what he's saying. So uh, hopefully there's something for all of us in this. And so we're looking at this, this one of these sort of core foundations that we, we probably say quite a lot as Christians uh, that God has authority. This is a probably more a common way of, of saying it, that God is in charge. Um, and we, we say these things all the time, but do we really uh, live it? Do we really believe it fully enough? Uh, because it means that we, in, in the difficult times, in the hard times, we have to push more into God and say it, it's God's uh, so, sovereignty uh, that's at play. It's, it's not my will, but his will and how we will do that and, and today i think we're so bombarded uh, by ways of how we can take charge of our lives uh, in this day that we, there's all sorts of apps and courses and all sorts of things that tell us um, you can ch take charge of your life today you can be the real you today you can save all this time i've, I've never i've i've when i see about new technology um, uh, you can probably see this on bbc click most people can watch that um, half of the time, I would probably say that app is going to make uh, uh, waste more of my time than it is it's going to save it. Um, and you have to be quite discerning um, to to know that. But you know, all these apps that tell you that you can take take charge, you can sort your life out. This all you need is a phone and an app, and you're there, you're done. Uh, and actually, uh, I can tell you as someone who, who knows a little bit about technology uh, that it's not always true. Uh, technology can sometimes hinder uh, at, at taking charge of our lives. Um, but we see this all the time. How many car ads have you seen that speak about owing, owning your own destiny? He's become a lot more grand, uh, being, being your own person. And yet apparently to be our own person, we've got to pay these significant sums of money uh, to get hold of this ownership of our destiny. Um, so apparently like 20,000 plus pounds uh, in car ads just to uh, get ownership of your destiny apparently uh, and unfortunately this mis-selling of taking charge of our lives generally leads to uh, having no charge of it at all and in fact we're told the lie by so-called televangelists that we can live our best life now that is an actual name of a book um, and it is a uh, lie we're told that God's sovereignty over all creation is nothing more than a sideshow it's just something that happened and that's what really important is what god can give you materially uh, not spiritually not a new life not a resurrection as it were but the christian faith is is one that renounces that rejects this materialism uh, and the little god way of life and instead put, puts god in charge both in a practical visible way but also fully in a spiritually renewed way before we get into our verses, I've got this verse here, Galatians 2, verse 20. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This sense of just everything for God, everything for him, everything. I've now been crucified. My old self is dead. My new life has begun. So if we're not focused on the ultimate mission of the message of the gospel and salvation only through Christ in everything we do, then we're only really serving our own egos and the need for human validation. I've seen this more and more, that there's a need for human validation in things, that 
uh, certainly social media and, and more and more streaming channels as, as it is people going online and offering their uh, views on life and all sorts of stuff but actually likes and follows and subscriptions and all sorts uh, it is a way of trying to find human validation uh, because we just uh, missed it we've got this fog that we just think that's where we find validation uh, and actually we can find it in Christ but in Christ it's no longer the self that seeks acceptance from others when we're Christians we don't seek acceptance from others rather that the self uh, that accepts Christ as our Lord and Savior who has chosen to invite and accept us into his family for his glory that is good news and that's what we'll explore today in Acts 5 as we see this demonstration of God's purpose uh, being at the core of what the apostles would do uh, when faced with persecu persecution by the Sadducees. So it's Acts 5 verses 17 to 42. This is uh, obviously a long set of verses, so bear with me uh, as we go through them. So from verse 17 it says, Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Talk about that in a moment. That's that's interesting. They, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin. Uh, the full assembly of the elders of Israel and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, uh, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people uh, that the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in, this na in his name, in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the, of the law who was honoured by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, uh, Thudas appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rowed to him. Uh, he was killed. All his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt he too was killed all his followers were scattered therefore in the present case i advise you leave these men alone let them go for if their purpose or activity is of human origin it will fail but if it is from god you will not be able to stop these men you will only find yourselves fighting against god his speech persuaded them they called the apostles in and had them flogged then they ordered them not to speak in the name of jesus and let them go the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering the great, uh, disgrace for his name. Day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, lots to, lots to unpack. I can't unpack all of it because we'll be here for about three hours, but... There is some main themes to to look at here so to understand the main uh, the atmosphere that we find here with the sadducees and to set the whole scene we need to first understand this sense of jealousy uh, and almost this jealousy that the sadducees had is is in, in this uh, translation in, in in probably every translation it's almost understated 
It's an understated jealousy. Um, the first question we need to ask them is, is, is why are they jealous? What, what is it they're jealous about? They don't believe uh, what the disciples believe. They don't uh, care much for uh, God in, in what he does. They actually don't believe that he uh, works within the people, that he does things on in that day. They didn't believe that. Um, they, they're very much of the of the Torah, of the uh, of God doing things in, initially, and now it's all about human activity with kind of God somewhere in there. So that's a kind of summary of what they believe. But what is happening is that the believers are going around talking about Jesus and sharing the account of the resurrection with them. What you'll find is that the problem they had is the resurrection. It's the big issue of the day. Uh, the big issue they had was them talking about Jesus rising again, who rose again. That's one of the main issues that they have with this. Uh, and that they can even they can see that that might cause them a problem as they go around preaching it. And as they do that, they gain more people to the kingdom. And it appears that the Sadducees are jealous because they are really losing control of the people uh, that in effect gave them the, gives them the purpose to be there. So they're kind of losing this control, very much want to control religiously uh, all these people and, and, and give them these kind of... Um, this sense that what they do, they're free to do it, and, and God will just sort of be there in the distance, in the background, as it were. Um, so they're jealous because they're losing control. Without the people fearing the Sadducees, then their authority is continually diminished. There's less and less people um, listen to them, and more and more people hear the truth and follow Jesus, so their power is loosened. And there is a sense that the Christians have something more tangible than the Sadducees could ever have, and specifically the death and resurrection of Jesus, who they rightly say is God. And this goes against their own belief system in God that only really serves in man's cause to control and subdue others who don't do as they do. So you can start to see this starts to uh, rub up against them. They just can't deal with this uh, sense of not, not an alternative Sadducees, an entirely different way of living that's what they're scared of but what does this word jealousy mean what what is why, why is it that it's uh it's so uh, it's an interesting point this isn't a casual form of jealousy uh it isn't it isn't secret this jealous this jealousy is actually described uh more closely to the translation as a sort of zealous religiously motivated rage motivated rage it says rage not not just i'm jealous of you not just like you know coveting your neighbor's ox or something whatever that you know uh, whatever the the coveting is i mean jealousy absolute rage driving them to say we, we are so jealous of you of what you're doing of you're taking away our control we're enraged by it this isn't casual they can see that the system they have is at risk of being compromised by these Christians. Romans 10 verse 2 says, For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. This sort of general sense of zealous for God, but have no real depth of a connection of a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Nothing is there. This religious sense of God rather than a uh, rather than a, a based in the Bible in Jesus through the Holy Spirit type approach in one of the commentaries I was reading it says when zeal for God is <coughs> sorry uh, when zeal for God is not grounded in the whole truth of God or is mixed with human pride or opinion it can easily become personal jealousy masquerading as piety that's what we're seeing here in all their zeal for God, of their understanding, it is in fact zeal for their own power and control. It is not for God, but against his will. Now because of this, the apostles are put in public jail. <clears throat> now this is very important once again. We have God gracefully showing us that there are no tricks going on here. Uh, even as we read in the text, um, God is gracious in showing very specific detail of how they got uh, out of prison uh, and, and then showing us proof through the text uh, that indeed it wasn't a trick. 
It's not that they picked the lock or paid a guard and later just said, we'll just say it was God. We'll just say God gave us some money to sort of pay, but let's just say it's God. No. The original translation says uh, exactly the same. They were put in public or common prison. And this sense of common prison, as we might see it today in the world, is consists of a, a similar to what we might see in the world, consists of a single room with a floor of earth, one small window where all manner of people from the murderer to the insolent debtor are crowded together. All standing together. The only furniture uh, consists of a bench, always occupied, as we probably see more in movies, by the strongest person, and no one will go near them. <coughs> the rest lie on the floor, stand around, walk around, um, but the keepers remain outside of the door. And the prisoners are not bound. So there's this sense uh, that we'll see in a minute, but actually in this particular case, there seems to be no others in the jail. So even more so, it'd be easier to see them leave. It'd be much easier to spot them get out uh, if it was under their own will or if they paid someone off or whatever. And so in this case, it appears that there's no other uh, people with them in the prison, but we do discover that the jail was locked and the guards were still outside. They didn't go asleep. They didn't um, go somewhere else for five minutes. They said the guards stayed outside. The gate with the jail was locked, actually locked. We can't figure out what this means. It's no surprise then that the Sadducees say, what does this mean? They got out without, so presumably from what they can tell, touching the gate, even opening it. They got past the guards without them seeing them. You can start to see the cogs are turning for the Sadducees. My goodness, what does this mean? There is no way that this was anything less than the angel of God setting them free from the cell. But what is the reason for setting them free and what do they do with that freedom? When the angel of the Lord sets them free, this angel says, tell the people all about this new life. What the angel told him was to go and speak about this life of salvation and eternal life in Jesus. <clears throat> I have to say on this, I've been reading just on, on this on this part about the angel. Um, some people said it was it was the angel of the Lord. Um, probably it's likely an angel of the Lord um, has come and set them free. Not that that really matters. Uh, it's still from God, and God is still doing it. And God has sent a messenger or an angel to go and and set them free. Um, but one particular thing I was uh, quite uh, interested by was that uh, as I was reading about this around this sort of this moment, I think it was John Piper I was reading, and, and there's a really interesting point that actually uh, when, when this, these things happen, God does something visible in our lives, intervenes and does something very visible and very practical. <clears throat> we, we always have to balance this with it, it's not always going to be the case. It's not always going to be that God will do something like that and set them free. And he says, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he, he says something like this when he, when he sees this. He says, uh, if God does this, he sets them free and he says, go and tell people about this new life. If he doesn't, they're just to live that new life whilst they're in prison. We see that in Paul. Paul continues to live his new life in Christ uh, and continues to do that even though he's in prison. So either it's to go and tell people about the new life in this sense, or even if God doesn't set them free, they still live to God. It changes nothing about what they do for God. And I just thought that was a quite an interesting way to put it because we can take sometimes these verses and think, well, the Lord will do something. Lord, Well, he, he's done something. He's set us free from sin. He's forgiven us and we'll be joining his family at some point in the future. How that happens is kind of secondary, right? Once we believe in Jesus, you know what? If stuff happens during life, God will be there and God will be speaking to you and helping you and supporting you. Absolutely. But the goal is do you believe in Jesus. Do you repent of sin and trust in him? You're going to go and see him in heaven one day. You're going to be there worshipping our one true God. So they're going to go out and they're going to tell people about this amazing Jesus what the angel didn't say was, go and brag about how you were right and that I confirmed your self-righteousness. Go and brag about how I set you free out of prison 
And because of that, it must mean I'm right. That can happen sometimes. We get a bit confused by why God does stuff and we, we think, that's God validating my righteousness. He's not. He's not doing that. He's, he's never doing that. It just so happens that our will at that point is, is agreeing with him. But it's still nothing to do with us. It's nothing about how right we are in those circumstances. And I have to say, in this country and many other countries, <clears throat> Christians are persecuted, <clears throat> excuse me, us to a lesser extent than others. Um, and unfortunately, we've picked, I think we've picked up some questionable habits, not, not just from the US, but maybe other places uh, around the world, um, in the way we demonstrate about certain worldly issues, excuse me, <coughs> I haven't got COVID, I promise. Um, we've picked up, I think, some questionable habits uh, from our friends, uh, maybe in, in other countries, where in the way we demonstrate against these worldly issues, such as abortion under the, the banner of Christianity. Uh, uh, how can I find a way that God agrees with me? How can I make the Bible agree with my view? Whatever your view on those subjects, it's God who's right. God is always right. And yet we like to place our righteousness above his, don't we? Because we're moral crusaders, aren't we? Perfectly moral. Nothing wrong with us, is there? Never compromising. And I think this approach, this, these, the, the, the way we do this has now created a form of persecution in our minds, which is, is not really persecution for faith in Jesus but really is a false perception of persecution, of our own personal views masquerading as Christianity. We need to be careful we're not looking for the Bible to validate our own political or personal agendas. It's not there for that. Just assume you're always wrong, and thankfully God's always right. And if I'm in Jesus, then Jesus is always right anyway. I'm just, we're just here to serve and here to do his will. That's what we're here to do. I don't know if you know that uh, real per Christian persecution on whatever scale it is, is, is only persecution for faith when it's professing salvation and resurrection in Jesus. I don't know fully what they talk about in underground churches facing persecution by the authorities such as China, but I bet you they're not self-righteously railing against political topics of the day to make themselves feel better than everyone else. And in fact, I know that what they are persecuted for is for sharing their faith with others at the risk of their own lives. Not their political motives or personal objections to government policy, but for Jesus. I'm going to show you a video, and it's, it's about four minutes long, but it's a great video of just a, a glimpse into the uh, underground church in China and just, just what they're doing. And it gives a real sense of what the disciples what the apostles were doing plainly, not worrying about these issues and these things. They were following Jesus, professing his name because they want people saved. That's what they want to do. Let's watch the video. Here in China, there is such darkness. But even in the midst of this darkness, we are experiencing God's victory. I became a believer 10 years ago. I heard about Christ when I was on a business trip. After that, my entire family came to Christ. but we are not free to share our faith with others. If you are spreading the gospel, Chinese government treats you as a criminal. They want to control the number of Christians. They want to control what God is doing. I hear from time to time of brothers and sisters being persecuted and arrested. Last week, a good friend of mine was taken by the Chinese police. He was questioned and then beaten so bad that he almost died. All because of spreading the gospel.
In the city, everywhere you look, there are apartments. Since we can't meet in public, our ministry takes place in the buildings we live in. In the evenings, brothers and sisters in Christ gather together in homes. This is our church. If you ask people on the street, most have never heard of Christ or read the Bible. No one in their family is a believer. The dangers here are driven by darkness, and that darkness can be quite fearful, especially when I think of my family. But God never fears, and He will overcome. So I want to go and share, despite being at risk. I minister to the neighbors that live next door or upstairs. I visit them often. I listen and I share in their life. When I get the chance, I tell the story of Jesus Christ and we pray. And the Holy Spirit works. Every week, we see new people come to Christ. Only two weeks ago, an amazing thing happened. We discovered there was another home church meeting at the top of this very same building. In our own building, God had brought up another fellowship. That really humbled us. In the midst of all the darkness, all the persecution, the Holy Spirit is moving. He continues to prepare the heart of people in China. Every day, I have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ, even if it means I could go to prison. For who can have victory over God? Nobody, no matter what country. I think um, you would agree that that was a uh, powerful video, um, and, and that that's that's what it that's what it's about. Uh, it's it's not about our, our agendas. Uh, we make it so complicated uh, when we talk about outreach and things, and actually, there is just space for talking about Jesus. Um, Nothing wrong with learning about the Bible and getting so deep into it. Because when we, when we face people and talk to them, we're going to need to show that we know about Jesus. At least the equivalent of what's in the Word. And they're, they're going to need to see that we love it so much, that we treasure it so much, that we want to tell them about it. My fear is that the Bible has become a way of pushing other propaganda not that the bible's propaganda but human propaganda i think we we need to make sure that's not happening here jesus is the only way to the father truth and the life so when we look at the bible we need to look at the bible as a means that, that it doesn't bully or ridicule people but it is a serious truth of life and death in Jesus and away from him. We won't win people to Jesus if we just make it like the rest of the world. 
The Bible is the one clear truth above everything else. That without Jesus, people are going to hell. Do you know what the apostles did after being set free? They, they didn't protest about the corrupt legal system, even as corrupt as it was. They didn't deserve prison. They didn't stand outside the prisons holding up banners about how Christians are treated in prison. They first stood in front of these authorities and proclaimed that they, the Jewish leaders, us, killed Jesus. But that was not because they hindered God's plan. In fact, they sadly, we sadly fulfilled it. So when we look at one side of the cross, it is sad that we fulfilled what God had already planned. On the other side, it's joyful that Jesus forgave us for doing it, for taking part in it, for being against him. And so at the same time, the apostles are now offering a way through Jesus in which they can be forgiven of their sin. The answer to the guilty verdict is to be found in Jesus. There is no other way to be found innocent. So they spoke of the resurrection of Christ that would ultimately bring them forgiveness of sin through repentance. Above all else, they were determined to spread the salvation of the gospel in obedience to God. This is what they speak of in front of the Sadducees and to others outside the Sanhedrin. There is no other agenda, just Christ. Now, of course, there is relationship, there's friendship, and that's all good stuff. We don't want to be disingenuous in our faith. We don't want to be fake in our faith. We're not trying to win friends so we can get them converted, maybe, as this phrase might go. We, we genuinely care for people who don't know Jesus. So we want to be their friends. We want to show them that there is a way to have eternal life through Jesus Christ. But the cost of that for the apostles was the threat of death. But luckily for the apostles, that wasn't to be. And remember the angel said, go and tell everyone about this life, this new life. How could they do that? That was a specific mission the angel had for them, or God, certainly. But how could they do that if they were dead? Because they're very practical. He, he knows his stuff. He knows they can't spread the gospel if they're not alive. Very clever like that, God. So uh, Gamaliel steps in. And he was this famous Jewish scholar and teacher and was given the highest possible title for Jewish, Jewish teachers uh, rabbi, 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 uh, and was highly regarded in, in later Jewish tradition. And we also find him later in Acts uh, being quoted by Paul, that he was the teacher of Paul as well, uh, when he was Saul. And, and Paul talks about, does a, a testimony, and he talks about uh, where he started. Uh, and he is one of the teachers, uh, or he is his teacher in the law. So it's, it's good to know that actually all that teaching led Saul to be Paul and to become a convert, to, be, to become a, a convicted by Jesus and to follow him and spread the gospel. But to summarize, he says, works of purely human origin come to nothing, but those from God cannot be stopped. He quotes two examples of revolts dying out after the leader died. The Sadducees believed only in human causation in history. So this argument works well for them. But the Pharisees affirm both the hand of God, as it were, the, uh, and, the, and the activity of human beings. But what this really drives us back to is this question, who is in charge? Who is in charge? Did it really matter that the Pharisee stepped in under his own merit? I'm sure he had his own motives, actually. So no, I don't think it really mattered. In fact, it's likely that he was making the case against this Jesus movement. It's likely that the fact he quoted these two uh, revolts is because actually he, he, he himself wanted this movement to die. And he wanted it to fail. Luke 1 verse 4. 
It says, so that you may know the certainty of things you have been taught. This, above all else, is where all of this kind of hangs onto. Everything that we are taught about Jesus Christ, that's what we're clinging to here. We're not clinging to man-made structures, man-made theories. It's all about what God teaches us. We can stand strong when we know the certainty of things that we have been taught. Regardless of the Pharisee intervention, it did not add or take away from the assurance that the apostles already had in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would have been willing to take death had that been the decision. But did God use the statement to show that this was not like any revolt or revolution? That this would not be the work of man or some menial political change? But in fact, the actual work of God, I would say yes. His statement would actually only later serve to show all the more that God is in charge. His hope that this movement would die. God completely shows him the opposite. He says, you are right, man-made things come of nothing. God's will and purpose always comes through, always comes through. And so whilst it wasn't put to death, it said the punishment was the 40 lashes minus one. Some people disagree with that. It might, might have not been, it might have been another punishment, but it was a triple strip of calf's hide, similar to the, the, the beating that Christ had. Two blows to the back, one to the chest. Each cycle was divisible by three, so ending in 39. Always about the maths, isn't it? It's great. Yet what they do after that horrific beating, what do they do? They rejoice. How does that make sense? Nothing in this world, nothing that the world can tell you about a way of life will say, when you're down, when you're beaten, rejoice in it. What does it do instead? I think the world says, pity yourself. Feel sorry for yourself. I have nothing wrong with people genuinely feeling uh, lost, feeling hurt and feeling pain. But this world tempts us into overly thinking of ourselves to the point where we start, it starts affecting our mental health. Luke 6 verses uh, 22 to 23 says this, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. This is what it means when the concept of God's authority and charge over all things really impacts us. So let me be clear. Being insulted, rejected, or excluded, using the Son of Man as a means to further a personal agenda is not on account of Jesus, but of our own selfish gain. Our best life is not now, and it should not be. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 21 to 30 says this. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that, Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the Jews the, uh, from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move, I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea and in danger 
from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. That is what the apostles are doing. They are boasting of their weakness and God's power. It is nothing to do with us, but I've been part of God's glorious plan. That is what they are celebrating. Not because of them, because of God. So as we come to the end here, our best life is when we will be reunited fully with our Lord and Saviour in heaven. That is going to be our best life. And I can't even describe what that looks like. Look at Revelation. You get glimpses in the Bible, but you're still not going to be prepared. Perfect life. No fear, no pain, no hurt. How can you fathom such a thing? So for now, we must pursue the principle of God's authority in the best way we can. We need to be careful on one side not to fall into compromising on the gospel, but on the other side, not withholding it from everyone else who ultimately might be led to be saved by it. We are not believers because of opposition. We are believers because we dare to put our faith in the word of God that will one day turn the hearts of the opposition. Dare we ask God for the opportunity to speak to those in opposition so that even if we are rejected by them, we may have another reason to rejoice in suffering dishonour for his name. Rejoice, for you suffer dishonour in his name. We are not believers because the Bible agrees with what we say and believe. We are believers because the Bible tells us what we need to believe for the sake of our eternity and why we need to believe it to be saved. Dare we ask God to challenge us through the Holy Spirit to constantly test our life against the principle that God is in charge. So, my final question, and I leave it with you. Do you want your best life now, free from the reality of what it really means to live for Christ? I hope that's no. Please say no, you don't want that life now. It's fake, it's not real. And the answer to this, the next one is yes. I'm gonna give you a hint, it's yes. Or are you content that whatever this life may endure for the glory of God, that our reward is in heaven when we return home? I was watching David Paulson this morning, just before I close this, and he did mention uh, something around this, but this, this fact of returning home. Now we're believers in Jesus, we are there. We're there. We have the Holy Spirit living within us, who is God. We're there. What we're doing here is telling people all about him. That's what we're doing here. But our home is ready. We're ready to return when, we, when it's time and give it to God and let him be in charge of our lives. Let's praise his name and then let's worship. Lord, we want to thank you that you have all things in your power, in your authority, for your glory. Lord, we want to do all these things. We want to do the things that glorify your name, not ours. Uh, glory, give credit to you and not our credit. Lord, we want to speak about you more. So, Lord, we ask for the opportunity to do so. Lord, do we need some opposition so we can tell them about Jesus? Lord, your will, that's your will and your decision and your plan. But Lord, open our hearts to what might be people that will either just accept you uh, as Jesus as you are, and that's amazing, who are sitting on the fence, undecided, And Lord, also those that are completely in opposition to you. Lord, prepare us for those conversations. Prepare us for staying on the gospel. 
keep on on the gospel. And Lord, we just want to we want to praise your name. We want to thank you that you are indeed in charge of all these things. Lord, challenge us when we get above our station and think we've got the bright ideas. Lord, we, we give all authority to you. Day to day, Lord, submitting day to day. Thank you that you know our struggle. Thank you that you know that we are not perfect. Thank you for Jesus, which means we have a way to the kingdom. Thank you for allowing us to even be in your presence. What an amazing God. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again so that we may have a new life in him. We thank you, Lord. Amen.